We are going to be uh, kind of all over the place in the Bible, three different, three different spots. Uh, but before we get there, we are in a sermon series called You Ask For It, and I love this sermon series every year. That, can you guys hear me? Maybe it's because I turned it off. <laughs> there we go. So each year I really look forward to this sermon series because it really does challenge me to, to not just give the answer that I think, but to give it an answer that I've looked into and wondered and I really... It's good that Brian calls it a box. Like whenever someone gives you a box to think in, you know, you don't have to think outside the box. But sometimes you do need to think outside the box. But this is just like, all right, here's the question, as opposed to you can preach on anything. Right? Does that make sense? And so this question is definitely a... a a wonderful question. It's a difficult question. If God loves all, gives grace, and forgives us our sins, why do some go to hell? You guys have really been challenging me this year. Last week it was, why is homosexuality wrong by God's standards? Next week I'm tackling, uh, how do you forgive what you can't forget? Which, uh, I love that question. I came across some information sometime in the last year about forgiveness, and it really changed my mind about what forgiveness looks like and how we forgive, and so uh, really looking forward to that next week. But as for this question, God does love all. God does give grace. God does forgive our sins. And in a way, God is our Father. And it, I think sometimes we have to look at real world, earthly situations in order to better understand our Heavenly Father and our Heavenly Standing. And so I look at all the babies born this year. This year, this over the past year, we have Harlow, we have Zelda, we have Ruger and Riley and Logan, Savannah, all the babies, not including all just the little, little ones either. But babies, we love babies, we love pregnant women because it's like, what is going to take place? What is, what is this little ball of potential going to be? You know, oh, even their eye color changes as they get a little bit older. Because what is, what is, this little baby is just a ball of clay. Full of potential. What, what's, the, what's his voice going to sound like? And, and is she going to be funny? Or is she going to be athletic? Or is she going to be creative? It's just full of potential in a baby. And as we get a little older, then we get some of those things figured out, right? Oh, well, they're, well, they're kind of a klutz. Or, oh, uh, they got a squeaky little voice. Or, oh, wow, they are so smart. They're so advanced. And in a way, some of that potential starts to be limited, doesn't it? When you're five or six years old, then you have less potential than when you were in a, a newborn. And that sounds sad, doesn't it? To have less potential. Less options. Less opportunities. Less freedom. But if you think about it, potential really isn't that great, right? Potential is that something could potentially happen. Potential is that something has not yet taken place. 
And so in a way, potential is only good because it has an opportunity to do something. But if you never do anything, potential doesn't matter. So our imagination gets stirred by babies, but we get moved by people who are doing things. So life goes on, our, our potential is decreased, but we are actually starting to do things. We have opportunities. But the sad thing is whenever opportunities are lost, whenever there's a life that, that had so much potential and they never capitalized on it. It's kind of like, oh, actually, this, this uh, Alfred Tennyson, we, he, he said a, a line that we all know, right? It is better to be loved and lost than to have never loved at all. Wouldn't you agree? Even in the heartbreak, you still appreciate that you got to be in love. Then if you wondered your whole life, you'd never been in love, and you wondered your whole life if you were missing something. So it doesn't matter if you are full of potential if you never do anything. And this is what this life is. This life is opportunity after opportunity. God gives us grace because we have opportunities. God loves us, so he gives us plenty of opportunities. God has forgiven us, and that's why he keeps giving us opportunities. It's kind of like uh, Amazon Prime or Netflix. They'll sometimes give you just 30 days free. Try it out. No commitment. Man, doesn't our, our society just loves no commitment? Our society loves no contract. Back out any time. Leave any time. All you have to do, she's leaving right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Courtney. <laughs> but we love free trials because we get to try it out with nothing on the line. I love free trials. I love, you know, I will, I'll watch as much Netflix as I can if I have 30 days for free. Because I'm probably going to cancel at the end of the 30 days. I will order as much as I can whenever I've got prime because I know I'm going to cancel it. I'll take advantage of what I can take advantage of and then I'll get rid of it. And this life is your opportunity. God has put so much goodness on this earth. He given, has given us uh, fruit trees. He has given us the blessing of watermelon. Oh, I love watermelon. He gives us different seasons to enjoy different things. Me and Penelope were talking yesterday. We were, we were doing the prayer walk around the park yesterday. And, and Penelope goes, man, it's hot out here. I said, it is kind of hot. But would you, rather, would you rather it be hot all the time or cold all the time? I'd rather it be cold all the time. And we do that because it's like it's something different. We're just going to complain about what's going on right now because we're uncomfortable. And I said, so would you rather sled or would you rather swim? Well, I'd rather swim. Then you'd rather it be warm because you can't, you can't swim in the wintertime. I guess you're right. I, I do like summer. <laughs> God has put this life together in a way that we have seasons of potential and we have seasons of doing and we have moments to sow seeds and we have times to harvest. He gives us a taste of so many different things in our lives. Even if you have a short life, you've probably gotten to experience a multitude of things. And if not gotten to experience it, you have the opportunity to experience it. Like Billy asking, who has repelled? 
If you have not repelled, it's because you have chosen not to repel. Mm -hmm. Most of you, you know, <laughs> like Laura probably hasn't had the opportunity yet. <laughs> this life is wonderful. And this life is our free trial membership to the church. This life is our opportunity to say, God, wow, I recognize all that you have put in my life. This is what Romans 1 says. Romans 1 is what we talked about last week. And in Romans 1, we didn't hit it, but this world is the visible image of the invisible God. When you look around and you get that breeze, that is like a physical manifestation of the rest that Christ wants to give you. When you walk through the shade tree and it gets a little bit cooler in temperature, that's the refreshment of Christ. Whenever you're going through a hard season, that is Christ refining you. And regardless of how you feel about Christ, He's working in your life. <laughs> Regardless of how you feel about God, he is working in your life. If you have ever experienced forgiveness, it's because God is working something in your life. And this is, this is what people get wrong. They think that, well, God hasn't forgiven me of my sin until I become a Christian. Or I am I'm not yet... I have to go to God and ask for forgiveness. But it's not true. One, almost 100% of your sin is paid for already. Did you guys know that? Regardless of where you are at in Christ, your sin is paid for. Whenever he was on the cross, he knew all of the sin of the world. Regardless of if you were alive yet or not. Because God is outside of time. God created time, and therefore, time does not control God. It's the other way around. That's why in the Old Testament, they were having a battle. And God made the sun stop. So that way the day was longer, so that they could win the battle. Man, I would love that, wouldn't you guys? <laughs> I saw a meme that said, like, I need a day in between each day to prepare for the next day. That would be nice. But the goodness of God has already forgiven you of all those swear words that you're going to say when you stub your toe for the rest of your life. Yeah, I hope you don't, but let's be honest, sometimes you will. He's already forgiven you for breaking the speed limit. He's already, breaking, he's already forgiven you for lust. He's forgiven you for lying. He's forgiven you for cheating, stealing. Every bit of it. You do not have to earn it. There's only one sin. The unforgivable sin. That Christ hasn't already forgiven you for. My first point today. The only sin that isn't already paid for is you believing you don't need Christ. The only sin that has not already been paid for is you believing you don't need Christ. This is what it means to be unrepentant. This is the difference. This is the change maker. A repentant person turns to Christ because they know they need it. An unrepentant person says, I don't need Christ. I can get through this life on my own. I don't need the forgiveness that he offers. I don't need the, the life that he offers. I don't need the truth that he offers. I can do it. Or I can look to something else to get me there. I can look to a person, I can look to a, another religion, I can look to all these different things, but unless you are looking at Christ for your need,
What is he to you? It's like at Netflix, you've got access to, I don't know, a thousand TV shows. In Christ, you have access to over an eternity's worth of heaven. Do you want it? Do you want to hit subscribe? Do you want to hit commit? Do you want to hit yes? Or is it a uh, cancel? Or remind me later, man, how many Apple updates is it? Remind me later, set up later, go at 4 a.m. I don't know, it doesn't ever do that, you know? It asks me tomorrow, do you want to do this at 4 a.m.? This is what Christ said. Truly I say to you, in Mark 3, truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man every sin of mankind is forgiven already on the death of, of Christ on the cross and whatever blasphemes they utter no matter how much they lie it's already taken care of but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin if you believe you don't need Christ, he respects you. He says, if you don't need me, you don't have to have me. And what you believe matters. Romans 1 also said, the righteous shall live by faith. And people definitely recognize that they need to believe in Christ. We do this. We, we know we need to believe in Christ. But we also know that obesity causes all-cause mortality to go up. All-cause mortality. What that means is literally everything that kills you is more likely to kill you if you're obese. Who's running to the gym? I got one hand. <laughs> Caleb is a trainer now, too, so yeah. maybe you can go to him for some advice. Yeah. We believe things, but if we don't really believe it, we don't really do anything about it. And so the righteous shall live by faith. What that means is that you will believe it to the point that you do something with it. If you believe that you need Christ, need Christ, not it's nice to have Christ, it's not okay, like I got that, but I need this other thing as well. If you believe you need Christ, your life will look substantially different than those who do not believe they need Christ. If you believe that walking out in traffic is a bad idea, and then continue to walk out in traffic, you don't really believe it. That's not belief. This is what Christ says, the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven, in Matthew 13, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and what? Sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, he wants to drive this point home, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Who on finding one pearl of great value. Went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is the truth. The kingdom of heaven. You will be sold out for it. The kingdom of heaven will be something that you pursue over every other pursuit. The kingdom of heaven, Christ will define something integral about you. The kingdom of heaven isn't like one of those, isn't an investment portfolio. Where 48% of your stocks are NVIDIA 
and then the other 52% are all the other things. He says the kingdom of heaven is like the guy who sells everything he has. So that way the one thing he can have is Christ. And Christ knows that family is important. Christ knows that your hobbies are enjoyable. Christ knows that you can't just sit around and read the Bible 24 hours a day. That's not what Christ did. But Christ did say that unless you hate your father and mother, then you cannot pursue me. Isn't that interesting? Unless your closest loved ones, by comparison, look like hate. He's not literally saying hate, obviously, because he says even if you hate your brother, you are guilty of murder. What he means is that by comparison, no love can even come close to touching what I've already done for you. What I've already given you. What I've already spent on you. How can you love anything as close as you love me if you really understand what's going on here? How can you continue to hold on to these, these rags when there is something of infinite value hanging in your closet? It doesn't work. There was another question, that a follow-up question to last week that said, can an openly gay Christian go to heaven? So you guys are getting a two-per question. A two-per question. The label says everything. It isn't a Christian who struggles with homosexuality. It isn't a Christian who is making mistakes. We cannot let anything define us above our Christianity. It can't be that Josh is a construction worker Christian. Because then the construction is what defines me more so than the Christian. It can't be that I'm a, I'm a stay-at-home wife and Christian. It has to be that I'm a Christian who works in construction. That I'm a Christian that stays at home and takes care of the home. I'm a Christian that, that serves in the government. I'm a Christian that is married or I'm a Christian that is single. What is the most important thing of your life? And if, what is the real defining belief? I don't, I don't care what you say. I love each and every one of you, and I enjoy the conversations we have. But really, whenever it comes down to it, God isn't concerned with lip service. What does your actual life say you believe? Because a married man will give up every opportunity with another woman, any woman, to be married to the one. When you get married, your bride is the last woman. Whenever you get married, your husband is the last man. There is no, well, I'm still playing the field, but I got this one on backup. If you're like, Josh, you're not wearing your ring, maybe you're super observant, my ring is broken. <laughs> Just want to point that out. <laughs> but once you get married, you are defined as off the market. Whenever you give your life to Christ, you are called to be off the market. For any other way of living than an openly Christian lifestyle. This is, this is our next point. There's going to be a wedding 
where loyalty and commitment is promised to one bride forever. Right now, God is providing us with a trial of goodness, a trial of opportunity. You get 30 years for free to enjoy this good earth. You get 60 years for free to enjoy my forgiveness. You get 95 years of grace. Will you commit to me? Will you commit to the marriage between the Lamb and the church? Or would you rather get married to something else? Would you rather commit your life to something else? This is the beauty that awaits those who say, I want to commit fully. No other option to Christ. Revelation 21, 2 through 4. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. There's no more long-distance relationship. God himself will be our God still, but will be present with us. And this is what he does. He will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. <clears throat> the goodness of this life is a taste. I'm getting, I'm getting attacked by a fly right now. The goodness of this fly, not landing directly on my face, <laughs> is a taste of the things to come. Where every pain, every bit of suffering, every bit of mourning, every bit of sorrow will no longer be. And we are sure of this because of what Christ has already done in our lives. Will you commit? Will you marry him? Will you say no other way but Christ? Christ said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Not a way, not part of the way, the way. Verse 8, though. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. If I was putting together a list, I would probably put uh, sorcerers and murderers first. But the list is started by cowards. We think being nice and being agreeable and being kind and saying yes is good. But unless you follow through, unless you are faithful and bold and courageous and honest and <clears throat> And real. Christ says. You don't even know me yet. Trust me when I say. People don't lead. Because they want to. People don't do things. For other people. Because they want to. On a regular committed. Ongoing consistent basis. 
There are days, dads, when you wake up and you say, why am I still doing this? And a lot of our culture, the dad doesn't continue to do it. Right? That's what's going on in the family. Dads are leaving. Because it's hard to lead. People don't want to lead when they've been leading for a while. People lead because they're committed. When commitment supersedes want, when loyalty supersedes comfort, that means you're sticking your neck out for Christ. That means you're sticking your neck out for something greater than yourself. That's why cowards can't go to heaven. Because unless your loyalty and commitment is to something greater than coming across nice, coming across as agreeable, coming across as, oh, uh, well, it shows that there's something that you love more than God and love more than people. Maybe you love your image. Maybe you love... Well, I don't want to fail. I don't want people to see me fail. I don't, want to, I don't want to overextend myself and then not be able to do it. I don't want to, to step outside of my comfort zone and then regret the decision. And Christ says, that's fine. But this is what we get. Cowardice can't be tolerated because there's too much on the line. Because if we know what is at stake, that there is a lake that burns with fire and sulfur, that is excruciating like a second death. If you love your brothers and sisters, you will do something about it. If you love God so much that he has, he has softened your heart to others, you won't want to sit by and watch while somebody else bears the burden. Whether it's church or work or in the family, you want to be involved because you know Christ is worth it. That this goodness we experience is God. Because this is the truth about hell, our last point today. Hell will be a place with no goodness. Hell is a place of judgment. It is a place where God's justice is eternal. The trial membership is over, and so there is no more enjoying the perks. The marriage has been finalized, so there's no more dating around. There's no more friends with benefits with God. This world has so much God influence in it that we think the world is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. But if you look at history, since the time of Christ, the world has gotten better and better and better. Education is better. Quality of life is better. Longevity of life is longer. Healthcare, we hate, we hate healthcare. We love to complain about it. What if there was no healthcare? What if there was no medicine? You had to go chew on a root <laughs> for pain management. Instead, we have bottles of liquid painlessness <laughs> sitting in our medicine cabinets. When you have a stuffy nose, you can breathe again with Dayquil. <laughs> <laughs> Since the time of Christ, life has gotten easier, more convenient, more wonderful. We wonder why Christ came at such a hard time. Listen, the trajectory of life without Christ was going downhill.
Christ comes and suddenly people start caring about one another. And it's only whenever the world starts to see that you can make a profit caring about people that they started caring about people. It wasn't until the Christians started doing health care. That's what we read in Acts, the daily distribution. Where the deacons of the church would go around, they would collect money, they would collect bread, they would collect food, and then they would give it out to the people who were hungry, who couldn't survive on their own. <coughs> the Bible is the resource manual for how to put goodness into the world. So you remove every Christian. You remove all of God's goodness from the world. It doesn't matter if there's a literal lake that is on fire spewing sulfur or if it is just what people have made the world. Because without goodness, without God, it is pain and suffering. Every moment here is an opportunity in grace. What is grace? Grace, by definition, unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. You can't earn it. But the only reason why we know what grace is, is because we know what the punishment is also. There can't be grace without punishment. There can't be forgiveness without wrong. Every moment here is, a, is an opportunity to ask for forgiveness. Every moment here is a loving act by a good God to postpone what you deserve. Will you sub up? Will you hit that subscribe button? Will you commit? Will you put a ring on it? Will you like the merchant, sell all of the wealth that you have accumulated in order to pursue the one who is worth pursuing. What is it that you are holding on to that you think is going to bring you more than Christ? There is a good God working and moving all out this world. And hell is a place where goodness, where God has been removed. Because he is respecting the wishes of those who say, I don't want anything to do with them. Christopher Hitchens said, he's a uh, famous atheist. If I met Christ, I'd say go to hell. John Milton, who wrote uh, Paradise Lost, it's a Christian allegory. He says, he, he, he puts into a narrative how he believes Satan and hell is going to work. And in that, he says, as Satan says, I would rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. One more, uh, what's his name? He was, he was very big in the uh, freedom from religion society, freedom from religion society. He says, why would I want to go to a celestial North Korea where the leader is eternally singing his praises? To someone who wants nothing to do with Christ, God gives them exactly what they want. Enjoy life without me. We have an opportunity. This is the thing. Until you are dead, once you are dead, you have no potential left. Until you are dead, you have potential. You have opportunity. Will you take it? Or in your problems, will you continue to say, I can find a way other than Christ? Christ will respect your wishes, even if he doesn't want it. God is not slow as some count slowness, but he is patient, wanting everyone to turn to him.
not wanting any to perish. That's what God wants. That's why God gives us this life. Will you take this opportunity? Let's go ahead and stand. At death, instead of potential, we are to give an account. Judge, this is what I did. This is what I did. These are the actions I took. What actions are you taking? God doesn't want to send any to hell. He wants to love. He wants to give grace. He wants to forgive. Do you want him? So we end on the question. Where are you going? Let's pray. Father God, I just pray for everybody here today that you will open their hearts, open their eyes, open their minds, not just to your truth, God, but to our own deception. Where do we say we believe something? But our life screams we don't believe it. God, I pray that we will be sold out, totally dependent, 100% in need of you for every breath, every thought, every need, every everything, God. Help us to turn to you. Help us to worship you. Help us to serve you. God, I pray that you will give us all courage and tender hearts as we go about our lives. Help us to reach our potential in you alone. In Jesus' name I pray.